In the previous video, I showed myself going to considerable lengths to recreate a unicorn piece of Philips pattern hardware, and it was actually a flip of the coin as to whether or not I was even going to bother filming it at all, and certainly it got quite a few more views than I was expecting, so I'm glad that so many people enjoyed it. So today we're just going to do a follow-up before we move on to another subject, and first of all, a couple of particularly interesting questions which were posted on that video. Now the first question is that is it possible to use the materials which were open sourced to create an entirely new, more modern device which does the same thing? And yeah, an effort like the one I undertook is not necessarily going to be for everybody, so something like this would be far more valuable. But depending on how much functionality was recreated, it would potentially be, be quite a big project. Now, DIY Philips pattern generators have been attempted in the past, but nobody has ever managed to build something with an output comparable to an original. But with this disclosure, that is now a significantly more realistic prospect. Now, this thing here just came through the mail slot this morning, and I think it contains a pretty good starting point for this kind of project. Contained within it is an ADV7393 analog video encoder, which is current technology and only costs 13 bucks. And I just did a quick performance test on it, and it's really good. It requires relatively few other components. So a fast microcontroller feeding a chip like this would probably be the best approach. Now, I'm not sure if this is a project I would be able to tackle myself, but I'm going to link to any relevant information in the description. Now, later on in the video, I'm going to look at another way to utilize the open source materials to see how we can possibly upgrade another piece of hardware. Now the second question, which I thought was especially interesting, is with all this complex digital circuitry on the board, why does it still need a bunch of tunable coils at the output? Well, let's go and have a look. To demonstrate what's going on here, we're going to attach a scope to this point on the circuit. And this allows us to see exactly what is coming out of the DAC before that magic filter. Now looking at the yellow trace on the oscilloscope, we can see the signal looks a little bit rough we can actually see the individual steps corresponding to the digital samples which are presented to the DAC. And this is not because it is a bad DAC, it definitely is not. It can actually reproduce CD quality audio at a 30 MHz sample rate. The blue signal is the output after the filter and it is looking very clean, more like what we would expect from a device like this. Now the signal that we're generating here is called a luminance sweep. Essentially it is a sinusoid of gradually increasing frequency now, as we scroll across to the higher frequencies, and I'm just going to have to stretch it out here a little bit, now we can see that the signal before the filter looks less and less like a sinusoid. But no matter how unrecognizable it gets, we always have a perfect sinusoid at the output. Now, without going into all the details, this is just what lower path filters do. And on average, the signal is a sinusoid, and this filter is what realizes that average. Now, it is important to point out that this is a very old design, and today's devices which generate analog video signals digitally, and yes they are made because we just looked at one, they do most of this filtering in the digital domain and do not require all of this coil magic at the output. There is another thing about this board which I want to talk about because I find it particularly interesting, and that is the color encoding circuitry. In the predecessor of this, the PM5644, the color components are generated by three DACs, one for luminance and two for chrominance. The luminance DAC is a significantly higher spec part because this part of the signal carries more information than the chrominance in composite video signals. Also in the 5644, which is mostly digital, the modulation of the color subcarrier is done with analog circuitry, and this had the advantage that the phase relationship between the color subcarrier and the horizontal sync was variable, which means that it is capable of a full gen lock, and this is a very important feature in a TV studio. I'm going to link to a little bit more information about that in the description because we can't really cover it here. The disadvantage of this design is that it is not possible to generate both PAL and NTSC because to switch between the two it has to be retuned and that is not a trivial exercise. On this board there is only one DAC, however somehow it still has that same variable phase relationship feature of its predecessor. To understand what's going on here, we have to look at these two big chips, and this is what I find really interesting about this design, because it is not something that you would have seen in any consumer equipment at the time. This chip here is a numerically controlled oscillator, and this is what is generating the color subcarrier. However, it is completely digital. Instead of analog sinusoids at its output, there are two data buses, one for sine and one for cosine, and written to those buses are numbers which represent points on a sinusoid. 
And because this implementation is purely mathematical, its two outputs are in perfect quadrature no matter what the frequency. Those data buses head into this chip, which is a digital mixer. And mathematically, it performs exactly the same operation as the analog circuitry in its predecessor, however, it works completely differently. The modulation of the color subcarrier is done with an ALU, making this chip a sort of a fixed function calculator, and its output is then connected to the DAC, which converts the result to an analog signal. This really is a no compromises design of the time. It is capable of full gen locking, all phase relationships can be programmed by software, and it can be switched between PAL and NTSC without having to be retuned. Now, back onto the topic of what else we can do with the resources from the recent open sourcing of this product line. Now, this here is a PT8601, and this was the basic analog signal generator. Now, unlike the 8631, these things are significantly more common, and I have seen several pieces of equipment containing them come up on eBay. And as much as it looks very similar to the 8631, there is a significant difference, which is that it only generates simple patterns like color bars, crosshatch, and what have you. Now, in terms of what we see on screen, the only advanced feature that it has is a text generator. The main thing holding the 8601 back is a severe lack of pattern ROM. And unlike its predecessor, the 5644, which was designed 10 years earlier and had up to 4.5 megabytes of pattern ROM, this thing only has a measly 256 kilobytes. There is a rather interesting question of why this even exists. And if they only wanted one output, for example, then don't populate the components for the other. If they wanted less patterns, program it with less patterns. There's no reason why there had to be two different PCB designs. And instead, we have this relatively minor variation, which was hastily put together less than a year later. And my guess is that the roadmap for this product line was either vague or just downright unclear to the engineers, and they ended up manufacturing both of them in parallel. And for whatever reason, it just wasn't worth consolidating the two designs. I was interested to see if there was some way we could upgrade this because it is just so similar. The first possible avenue was an actual software upgrade which gives the 8601 a single complex pattern. The only one that we know of is for the 4 to 3 PAL circle pattern which I guess is better than a standard configuration and hasn't actually got enough memory for anything more. Now, unfortunately, when ProTelevision were putting together the handover package for this product line back in 2001, they missed out the modified firmware for the microcontroller. It went unnoticed, so we don't have this upgrade. And I've never seen an 8601 programmed with it either. And none of the 8601 source code that they hand over contains the code for that modification annoyingly. So if we really wanted it, well, that part would have to be re-implemented, which would be pretty difficult because it is all written in assembler and it's quite complicated. The bigger prize would be to convert it to an 8631 because it has a lot more features and we have everything required to do it. Now, I spent a few evenings studying the two designs to see if this was possible and I concluded that it probably was. And this one here has had that upgrade, so let's quickly go over what had to be changed. Now, first of all, obviously it needs more pattern memory. So I whipped up this adapter PCB, which plugs into the existing EEPROM sockets and carries the four larger flash chips, the same parts that are used on the 8631. The three extra address lines are connected from the end of that board to this chip here. But there are other less obvious changes. All of the programmable chips on the board now contain different code and the 8051 microcontroller had to be replaced with a higher speed version. Generating complex patterns with the option of an in-pattern clock requires just a little bit more horsepower than it originally had. And in addition to that, there are a few other relatively minor modifications, and we can see that there's a few extra wire mods which I've added to the board. And one of these wire mods was already here because this is an old version of the 8601. Now, of course, that question on everybody's mind, why am I even bothering with this when I already have one? Well, this unit is being sent off to Stephen from the Republic of Ireland, who was actually the very first person to subscribe to my channel. He has long aspired to own an original Philips pattern generator, but has discovered firsthand just how difficult that is to realize. Now, Ireland is a rather special place to talk about in the context of the Phillips patent because as far as I know, it is the last country in the world where it is still routinely used. In fact, it was on air at the time I was putting this video together. 
Now, what I've just said might raise an eyebrow in some quarters, so let's just take a minute to explain what's going on here. The test card is transmitted from time to time on their Freeview service on spare channels. Now, I don't know why they do it, but they do, and they do it quite often at that. Now, this being an analog pattern does not mean they are still running analog TV. They're not. It's actually being generated digitally by a piece of equipment called the PT5300, which is from the same product family as this. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about it today because it really needs its own video. Now, the unit I'm about to send off is going to include a second option, the PT8637. This is the clock module for these generators, and you cannot enable the in-pattern clock unless it is installed. And once again, it is another very unlikely item to find. Now, this particular one was built using the same process seen in the previous video, but it's inexpensive and trivial to build. Now, on the subject of the PT5300, it also requires an 8637 to be able to enable the clock. Now, once upon a time in Ireland, the widescreen Philips pattern had the in-pattern clock enabled, however, it has not been seen for a number of years now. And there are a couple of possible reasons why this may be. Firstly, they may no longer have a working clock module, and if that is the case, well, today, there just aren't any official options to obtain another one, unfortunately. And the second, and probably more likely, explanation is that the entire piece of equipment has reached the end of its service life, and instead they're using a historic recording, and yeah, it would be pretty hard to keep the clock in that scenario. Now, bear in mind that today, all of this equipment is vintage by commercial standards. My PT5300 is 17 years old. Whatever is going on here, I think it's really cool that they're still transmitting an analog test card from 1993, so that's a big thumbs up from me. And for all of this, I think it's also really cool to be sending a Philips pattern generator to Ireland, which actually has a working in pattern clock. Anyway, that is all for this video, and I hope this old bit of kit is well received, and to everybody else, thanks for watching.